Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the final session of uh, the Mises University for 2013. I want to, first of all, uh, congratulate you and salute you for your excellent judgment in being here. <laughs> if you don't already know, uh, this is one of the best programs available for students anywhere in the world. Uh, for any kind of learning, but certainly for learning Austrian economics, uh, this program has no peer. And so you have, you have attained a gold standard of sort, even if it's not one for the medium of exchange. So that, that's next year, <laughs> we hope. But at all events, uh, uh, I applaud you for being here. I, I have no doubt that you've learned a great deal uh, because you've been able to uh, listen to and talk to uh, some of the world's best <clears throat> Austrian economic, e economists, and uh, not to mention David Gordon, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> polymath supremo. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know something, I know something, David knows everything. <laughs> so, so <laughs> and I'm not joking. So, <laughs> so uh, just the chance to come and uh, sit at David's feet would be worth the trip, without a doubt. But at uh, all events, here we are at the end of it. You're, you're marvelously alert, I must say. Uh, uh, back in the days when uh, Murray Rothbard was the, was the heart and soul of this uh, uh, annual meeting, uh, students would stay up till three or four o'clock at night talking to Murray, which was just his regular schedule. <laughs> and then the next morning at nine o'clock, they'd have to somehow be in, be in the next class. And that made it very difficult. Uh, and even young people after six or seven days of that were getting pretty weary. But it was worth it. And uh, it, even now, uh, we miss Murray uh, terrifically. He was... Uh, he was, as I say, the heart and soul of this enterprise and of Austrian econo economics in the United States. And, uh, and he's left a tremendous legacy for us so we can occupy ourselves very fully for a long time just reading Murray's writings. And uh, I myself am, am still making my way through them and, and, and getting good payoffs from doing it. And I trust you will too. Uh, my talk this time is, um, as you can see, called The State is Too Dangerous to Tolerate. And uh, uh, this is a, a meeting and a group where we don't have a lot of laudatory things to say about the state. So uh, perhaps by this time you'll consider what I have to say to be overkill. But I select that word uh, judiciously because uh, what I want to suggest to you is uh, that the state is not only a nuisance, uh, not only something that makes e economic life less productive uh, and inefficient than it, than it should be and ought to be and would be, but for the state's interventions. But I want to suggest to you that the, the state poses a mortal danger to all humanity and that this is uh, the best reason of all for being an anti-statist, for fighting against statism in every way you know how. And uh, if I seem to be making some value judgments as I go along here, uh, I'm not going to apologize for them because they're, they're not much uh, more adventuresome than the, the value judgment that I prefer life to death. And uh, I would like to see other people live rather than be destroyed by the state. I'm going to draw on uh, a paper that was published in the Journal of Libertarian Studies uh, a few years ago uh, called If Men Were Angels. And uh, some of what I'll say today you'll find there, but you'll find uh, uh, quite a bit more development of some of these ideas there than I have time to present to you this afternoon. So uh, if you if you're interested in anything I have to say here, I recommend that you, that you find this uh, article. It's available online, like virtually everything that the Mises Institute uh, has anything to do with. So uh, it's there for your, for your perusal. 
I'm going to be dealing with the state uh, more or less in the way that, that uh, Franz Oppenheimer uh, taught us a century ago or so to think about the state. Oppenheimer distinguished the, the economic means of getting uh, goods and services that satisfy human needs and desires from the political means of getting wealth, and uh, that corresponds pretty much to the distinction between free choice and state force, or as, as it were, the distinction between markets and states. So let me begin my talk by saying something about the state and social disorder and liberty. Uh, by the state, I mean, uh, as Max Weber meant, uh, a territorial monopoly of law and order, uh, of legitimate force and violence that collects involuntary tribute from the inhabitants of a, a bounded area and makes rules that it enforces on the people in that area. Uh, hardly anything is more common than the assumption that without a state, a society will fall necessarily and immediately into violent disorder. Indeed, anarchy, uh, a word we have from the Greek meaning without a ruler, uh, anarchy and chaos are often used as synonyms. Uh, the Random House Dictionary gives the following four definitions of anarchy. And perhaps some of you have looked up anarchy in the dictionary before and found these. Uh, some of them are fairly straightforward, like the first one, although that can be misleading as well. Uh, but I'm particularly interested in the third one, uh, which describes anarchy as a theory that regards the absence of all direct and coercive government as a political ideal, and that proposes the cooperative and voluntary association of individuals and groups as the principal mode of organized society. And uh, to the extent that any one of us in the room here espouses anarchy, it's in this sense that we espouse it. Uh, suppose, however, that the situation described by the third definition were not merely a theory or an ideal, but a genuine possibility, perhaps even a historically instantiated condition. Of course, John Locke, James Madison, Mansur Olson, and nearly everybody else have concluded from their theoretical deliberations that the stateless option cannot exist, at least not for long, because its deficiencies make it so manifestly inferior to life in a society under a state. In uh, Federalist 51, uh, Madison wrote these words, uh, very famous words, and uh, they're part of a little longer discussion uh, that I deal with in the article I referred to. Uh, but if anybody remembers anything from the Federalist Papers at all, uh, there's a high likelihood that it, that it may be this passage. Uh, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. And if angels were to govern men, Neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. And then Madison goes on to talk about how framing a government requires that we have a government to administer over men, but we must somehow provide a means of controlling that government. And this is the way in which political philosophers and political scientists have almost always thought about the issue for centuries. I, I set up a little table to, to help me and others think about what's going on here, and it looks like this. Uh, if, if men are angels, and we can pass pretty briefly over that alternative, uh, it's okay with no state, it's okay with a state. It doesn't matter because even if there's a state, the people who compose it and operated are angels, and so they're certainly not going to do anything untoward. Uh, but in the realistic uh, option on the, the second line, men are not angels, 
But <clears throat> for Madison and for almost all others, uh, the idea that we would have no state is simply inconceivable. The, they were the heirs of, uh, of the kind of reasoning advanced by Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and, and for these people and many others, uh, individuals would find it very desirable to form what we now call the state in, in order to effectively protect their natural rights. And they would recognize that absent the state, uh, they would be incapable of protecting their natural rights, and so they would probably be subject to all the horrors that Hobbes described as the state of nature. Uh, and therefore, the best conceivable situation in a world where men are not angels uh, is that we have a state and allow it to rule over us in the way I described earlier. The alleged absence of significant uh, historical examples of large stateless societies during the past several thousand years buttresses these theory-laden uh, conclusions just as the poor we have always with us, so, except among primitive peoples, society and state are taken to have always coexisted. Now, one need not spend much time, however, to find uh, theoretical arguments, some of them worked out in great detail and at considerable length, uh, for example, in Rothbard's uh, work and in David Friedman's work, uh, arguments about why and how a stateless society could work successfully. Moreover, researchers have adduced uh, historical examples of large stateless societies ranging from the ancient Harappan civilization of the Indus Valley uh, from as far back as 3300 BC uh, running up for the next 2,000 years to about 1300 BC, uh, a society that flourished for almost two millennia and flourished to a high degree for much of that period. Uh, examples ranging from Harappa to Somalia during the past two decades. And given the enormous literature that has accumulated on stateless societies in theory and in actual operation, we may conclude that if nothing else, such societies are conceivable. And uh, for a large compendium of uh, literature on the entire subject, I, re I recommend the book published, uh, edited by uh, Ed Stringham in 2007. Um, uh, from this literature, I've been led to think in terms of what I call a more realistic model than Madison's. This one, again, men are angels, the state is irrelevant one way or the other, but if men are not angels and there's no state, we will have a bad situation. Uh, uh, we would be fools to argue that if we simply got rid of the state, we would produce heaven on earth. That's not the nature of the human raw material. Some of us are no damn good. Okay? <laughs> and that seems to be a condition that, try as we may, we can't change. So it's always going to be the case that in society are some individuals that are inclined to, to criminal actions and aggression against their fellows. And that has to be dealt with somehow. So if we have no state to deal with it, uh, we will definitely have a bad situation. However, I maintain that if we do have a state purportedly to deal with it, we will have a worse situation. Okay. Although I admit that the outcome in a stateless society will be bad, because not only are people not angels, but many of them are irredeemably irre vicious in the extreme, I conjecture that the outcome in a society under a state will be worse, indeed much worse, because, first, the most vicious people in society will tend to gain control of the state. And second, 
By virtue of this control over the state's powerful engines of death and destruction, they will wreak vastly more harm than they ever could have caused outside the state. It is unfortunate that some individuals commit crimes, but it is stunningly worse when such criminally inclined individuals wield state powers. Lest anyone protest that the state's true function or duty or end is, as Locke, Madison, and countless others have argued, to protect individual rights to life, liberty, and property, the evidence of history clearly shows that, as a rule, real states do not behave according to that ideal. The notion that states actually function along such lines or that they strive to carry out such a duty or to achieve such an end resides in the realm of wishful thinking. Although some states, in their own self-interest, may at some times protect some residents of their territories other than the state's own functionaries, such protection is at best highly unreliable and all too often, nothing but a solemn farce. Moreover, it is invariably mixed with crimes against the very people the state purports to protect, because the state cannot even exist without committing the crimes of extortion and robbery, which states call taxation. And, as a rule, of course, this crime is but the merest beginning of the state's assaults on the lives, liberties, and property of the resident population. In the United States, for example, the state at one time or another during recent decades, during recent decades, we're not talking ancient history, has confined millions of persons in dreadful steel cages because they had the temerity to engage in the wholly voluntary buying and selling or the mere possession of officially disapproved products. Compounding such state crimes, that is, crimes of kidnapping and unjust confinement, with impudence, state officials brazenly claim credit for their assaults on the victims of their so-called war on drugs. State functionaries have yet to explain how their rampant, unprovoked crimes comport with the archetype described and justified in Locke's second treatise of government. In vain do many of us yearn for relief from the state's duplicitous cruelty. Where is the state of nature when we really need it? Now, I want to go on and uh, talk about the precautionary principle and uh, what I think so is a new application of it, at least to my knowledge, it's a new application. Uh, in pondering the suitability of, of my more realistic model, we might, we might well apply the precautionary principle, uh, which has been much discussed and, and nearly always misapplied in recent years in relation to environmental policy. This principle holds that if an action or policy might cause great irreparable harm, then, notwithstanding a lack of scientific consensus, those who support the action or policy should shoulder the burden of proof before the action is taken or the policy implemented. In applying this principle to the state's establishment and operation, the state's supporters would appear to stagger under a burden of proof that they cannot support with either logic or evidence. Everyone can see the immense harm the state causes day in and day out, not to mention its periodic orgies of mass death and destruction. In the past century alone, states caused hundreds of millions of deaths, not to the combatants on both sides of the many wars they launched, whose casualties loom very large, but to quote-unquote, their own populations, 
whom they have chosen to shoot, bomb, shell, hack, stab, beat, gas, starve, work to death, and otherwise obliterate in ways too grotesque to contemplate calmly. J.R. Rummel, who spent a lifetime compiling data on this so-called democide, uh, non-war state killing, uh, now has a total of uh, 262 democide victims in uh, the 20th century, uh, 262 million. And if you go to his website uh, for J.R. Rummel, democide, you can find uh, a great deal of data on this matter, all sufficiently horrifying uh, data, I might add. And I believe uh, even Rummel's numbers are understatements of the amount of true democide, because many state actions, such as the Food and Drug Administration's uh, uh, actions that have caused hundreds of thousands of premature deaths, are not included in Rummel's compilations, only people that were violently killed outright. But the state has enough imagination to find many indirect ways of killing people as well. Yet, almost incomprehensibly, people fear that without the state's supposedly indispensable protection, society will lapse into disorder and people will suffer grave harm. Even an analyst as astute as Mansur Olson, who speaks frankly of, quote, governments and all the good and bad things they do, end quote, proceeds immediately to contrast, quote, the horrible anarchies that emerge in their absence. Although he gives no examples or even citations to support his characterization of anarchy. But the state's harms, in Olson's words, the bad things they do, are here and now, undeniable, immense, and horrifying. Whereas the harms alleged to be suffered without the state are specters of the mind and almost entirely conjectural. Anarchists did not try to carry out genocide against the Armenians in Turkey. They did not deliberately starve to death millions of Ukrainians. They did not create a system of death camps to kill millions of Jews, gypsies, and Slavs in Europe. They did not firebomb scores of large German and Japanese cities and drop nuclear bombs on two of them. They did not carry out a great leap forward that killed scores of millions of Chinese people. They did not kill more than 500,000 members of the Indonesian Communist Party, alleged party sympathizers, and others. They did not attempt to kill everybody with any appreciable education in Cambodia, murdering one-fourth of the country's population. They did not kill as many as 200,000 Mayan peasants and others in Guatemala. They did not kill more than 500,000 Tutsis and pro-peace Hutus in Rwanda. They did not implement U.S. and allied trade sanctions that killed perhaps 500,000 Iraqi children. They did not launch one aggressive U.S. war after another. There's a great deal anarchists did not do, but status did do. States are clumsy and inept in many ways, thank God. <laughs> but they are exceptionally good at wreaking death and destruction. Indeed, if they were not, they could not sustain themselves as states. In a functional sense, we may define the state as the organization with comparative advantage in deliberately, violently killing people and in appropriating and destroying wealth. What you see here are human bodies piled on a rail car in Dresden. This is only one of many such piles made after the British and American Air Forces decided in February of 1945 
to firebomb this old and beautiful city when the war was clearly already won. These are some of the products of the German government at its death camp at Bergen-Belsen, as depicted in 1945 after the Allied troops had overrun the area. There were so many such pits in Eastern Europe that you cannot even begin to imagine them. Here are some of the lucky ones. After the state had had its way with them at Auschwitz. And that's the scene of what was left of the city of Hiroshima. After the US government took pleasure and dropping an atomic bomb on this place that had little or no military value at a time when the war was absolutely conclusively won. And here's a more recent scene in the Iraqi city of Fallujah. Unfortunately, I could not find any of the photographs that depict in a visually compact way, the full horror of what the U.S. Armed Forces did in that city, particularly by their use of white phosphorus and other munitions that have horrifying effects on human beings. And if you read about Fallujah, you'll find that ever since these attacks, babies have been born with horrifying deformities in that city and will probably continue to be born for many years to come. The debate between status and anti-status is, in my judgment, not evenly matched. Defending the continued existence of the state, despite having absolute certainty of a corresponding continuation of its intrinsic engagement and extortion, robbery, willful destruction of wealth, assault, kidnapping, murder, and countless other crimes, requires that one imagine non-state chaos, disorder, and death on a scale that non-state actors seem completely incapable of causing. That's what I just said. I'd like to take a moment and let you read it. Nor, to my knowledge, do important historical examples attest to such large-scale non-state mayhem. In general, with regard to large-scale death and destruction, no person, group, or private organization can even begin to compare to the state, which is easily the greatest instrument of destruction known to man. Almost all non-state threats to life, liberty, and property appear to be relatively petty and therefore can be dealt with. In general, only states can pose truly massive threats, and sooner or later the horrors with which they menace mankind inevitably come to pass. The lesson of the precautionary principle is plain. Because people are vile and corruptible, the state, which holds by far the greatest potential for harm and tends to be captured by the worst of the worst, is much too risky for anyone to justify its continued existence. To tolerate it is not simply to play with fire, but to chance the total destruction of the human race. I want to 
say a few words now about some dynamic considerations that enter into this subject. Classic discussions of the state versus non-state societal outcomes usually involve static comparisons. They ignore the changes that occur systematically with the passage of time. For example, a Hobbesian or Lockean account stipulates that in a state of nature, which has no governing state, a great deal of disorder prevails, and adoption of a state brings about a more orderly condition. Analysts recognize that the people sacrifice some of their liberties when they adopt a state. Hobbes goes so far as to suppose that the people sacrifice all their liberties to an omnipotent sovereign in exchange for his promise to protect their lives. A ruler always assures his victims that their loss of liberties is the price they must pay for additional security and order he purports to establish. Well might we question whether the ruler has either the intention or the capability to reduce the degree of social disorder. Plenty of evidence attests that state-ridden societies boil with disorder. In the United States, for example, a country brimming with official protectors of every imaginable stripe, the populace suffered in the year 2011, according to figures the government itself endorses, which are certainly understatements, almost 15,000 murders and non-negligent manslaughters, more than 83,000 forcible rapes, 354,000 robberies, 751,000 aggravated assaults, and more than 9 million property crimes, such as burglaries, larcenies, and thefts. The governments of the United States have taken the people's liberties. If you don't think so, you need to spend more time reading U.S. statutes at large in the Code of Federal Regulations, not to mention your state and local laws and ordinances. So they've taken the liberties, but where's the protective quid pro quo? They broke the eggs of our liberties without a doubt, but where's the bloody omelet of personal protection and social order? Where? Suppose we concluded, if only for purposes of discussion, that the initial establishment of the state reduces the degree of social disorder. The obvious question, however, seldom asked by philosophers, then becomes, what happens next? Does the degree of social disorder remain constant? Everything we've discovered in theory and by observation flies in the face of such constancy. In fact, the likely progression over time is that under state domination, social disorder tends to increase. This tendency exists because the state attempts in countless ways to compel people to act against their perceived self-interest and people respond by resorting to all sorts of evasions, black markets, and officially defined crimes. Consider, for example, what happened when the state ordered people not to make, sell, possess, or consume alcoholic beverages or certain narcotics, namely black markets and crime galore, including countless assaults and murders. Of course, the state's uh, orders to pay stipulated taxes or fees have given rise to a plethora of evasive measures, some of them carrying violence against persons or the destruction of property in their train. Perhaps equally important, the state's concentration of its police forces on tax colle collection, enforcement of victimless crimes, and other measures at odds with the people's perceived self-interest diverts those forces from making any more than a token attempt to protect people against such everyday crimes as murder, rape, robbery, and fraud, whose prevention the people actually value. Over time, the social misallocation of the state's pr protective services grows as the state itself shifts more and more resources toward the enforcement of laws adverse to the people's genuine interests 
and, as the people make, moving targets of themselves in ways that augment the degree of social disorder. If the degree of social disorder in a society under the state tends to increase, then, even if the initial establishment of the state did reduce disorder, a time will come when the degree of social disorder will exceed that of a society with no state. If so, then, momentarily taking for granted the myth of a social contract, the initial bargain the people struck will eventually come to be seen as a pact with the devil, a bargain that at best held advantages in the short term but proved to be a disappointing deal all around in the longer term. Moreover, whereas under a state, social disorder tends systematically to increase, without the state, social disorder tends systematically to decrease. This latter tendency reflects the progressive and mutually advantageous solution of social problems characteristic of a free, spontaneous order. We have had three centuries of instruction in the workings of the spontaneous order of a free society, stretching from Bernard de Mandeville, Adam Ferguson, and Adam Smith in the 18th century, to Carl Menger in the 19th century, to F.A. Hayek and Murray Rothbard in the 20th century, to their numerous followers in the 21st century. Unlike the forced exchanges and coerced arrangements enforced by the state, the protective and productive innovations of a spontaneous order, a non-state order, can achieve acceptance only voluntarily, which is to say only when all who participate in them expect them to produce net benefits. Consider, for example, a simple example of the householder who keeps a watchful eye on his neighbor's property when the owner is away just as the neighbor will watch his property when he is away, and contrast this simple, effective, cooperative form of protection with the faux protection of the state's police officer, who occupies himself at great public expense, driving about aimlessly, harassing citizens pointlessly, and loitering in the donut shop. <laughs> The only shops kept open in a large sector of Boston when it was clamped down into virtual mar martial law recently. You see the connection. <laughs> Neighborliness spreads naturally and beneficially, whereas state protection, quote, protection, spreads cancerously and harmfully. The one preserves liberties, the other destroys them. My foregoing argument expresses, among other things, uh, what Thomas Jefferson uh, stated more eloquently when he wrote, the natural progress of things, that is, the natural progress in a society under a state, is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. Those are the dynamics we have to face here. Thus, even though the mythical people entering into a social contract might have considered their sacrifice of liberties to the state at that time a price they were willing to pay, they could scarcely have suspected that with the passage of time, their remaining liberties would be paid one after another, notwithstanding the social order they initially received from the state in return would systematically diminish. If a population acts to serve its common interests, it will never choose the state. In reaching this conclusion, we need not deny the countless problems that will plague people living in a society without the state. 
Any anarchical society being peopled in normal proportions by vile and corruptible individuals will have crimes and miseries aplenty. But everything that makes life without a state undesirable makes life with a state even more undesirable. The idea that the antisocial tendencies that afflict people in every society can be cured or even ameliorated by giving a few persons great discretionary power over all the others is, upon serious reflection, seen to be a wildly mistaken notion. Perhaps it is needless to add that the structural checks and balances on which Madison relied to restrain the government's abuses have proven to be increasingly unavailing. And bearing in mind the expansive claims and actions under the present U.S. regime, these checks and balances are now almost wholly superseded by a form of executive Caesarism in which the branches of government that were supposed to check and balance each other have instead coalesced into a mutually supportive design to plunder the people and reduce them to absolute domination by the state. Today, however, I have tried only to show how we may think more clearly about the choice between a society under the state and a society composed of genuinely self-governing individuals. Assuming that we really had such a choice, the better option seems to me fairly obvious. If you take anything away from my arguments and my evidence, however, I hope that it will be an appreciation of how highly warranted is an application of the precautionary principle in choosing between anarchy and the state. Fire has proven to be a magnificent aid to human beings. But a fire that cannot be contained portends our utter destruction. And the state is precisely such a fire. Thank you very much. actually done the impossible. I finished early. <laughs> and uh, I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> it's a first. But because I finished early, uh, I am prepared to accept questions if you would like to ask questions. I'm um, part of a concern that I have, and philosophically, I'm at the point where I can say, if you disagree with Murray Rothbard, you are probably wrong. Uh, where I'm at right now is that in the event something bad goes wrong, historically people tend to either, but these vicious people, which you do correctly point out, they do exist, they either want to grant themselves power or give power to others, mm -hmm. and I'm at the point where I don't see a way out of, at some point or another, a totalitarian state, and um, how do we get through this within the anarchic um, society, because uh, basically just convert me and I am terrified right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> In, in case you didn't hear the question, it's how do we get from here to there? And I don't have an answer to that. I, uh, I have an answer only in the sense that I think there are things that can be done that move us in that direction. Whether they will prove sufficient to get us where we need to be, I don't know. 
but I have no doubt whatsoever of the direction in which we need to move. Uh, we are, in this country, in my view, closer to complete totalitarianism than we have ever been before. Uh, even during World War I, during the madness of the Sedition Act and the vigilantism and the countless crimes that were committed at that time, even during the most extreme episodes of our history, the state has never had the kind of power that it has now, particularly the power of surveillance that it now possesses. By virtue of the kind of technology we use for communication and by virtue of the state's measures, which we now know uh, basically scoop up everything we say to one another, every transaction we make in, in the economy, uh, a host of things we do, including where we are at every moment of the day and night, uh, this kind of information has never been available to the state ever, anywhere in history. Uh, people have always had certain options of hiding, of running away, of escaping. And those options are being closed off by the kind of power the state's information control now gives it. So, like you, I'm terrified. Uh, now, I'm taking my own personal measures to do what I can in these circumstances to protect myself and my family. And I would strongly suggest that each of you think along the same lines. But meanwhile, there are things we can do to, to help move the entire situation away from the brink where we now stand. And I believe that indeed what you've been doing here this week uh, is a helpful part of those actions. We, we need to learn and understand the situation we're in, how we got here, and particularly what kinds of beliefs uh, sustain uh, the system we now confront. Uh, it's viable only because the great mass of people are either in favor of it or indifferent. We can actually sway some of those people if we help them to understand what has happened and what the present condition is. So it, it, it seems as if it's such a small thing to educate ourselves and try to educate others, and yet it's a doable thing. And it's something that really not very many of us understand with the depth and subtlety that is required to fully meet objections to moving away from this brink. People are frightened. They're easily frightened. Uh, they're afraid of, in this case, specters. In my judgment, there was never such an illusory threat uh, in history, unless you think that people were afraid of witches, uh, as the terrorist threat today. It is almost entirely fictional. The, the chances that a terrorist will hurt you or me are so tiny that they will hurt anybody in this country are so tiny that it is virtually idiotic to worry about them, much less to pour hundreds of billions of dollars into dealing with them. And yet, our fellow citizens out there are willing to either tolerate this kind of action by the state uh, or actually to support it, to root for it, to, to argue in favor of it. We, we need to confront these people whenever we can and try to educate them. That we can do. We don't know how much success we'll have, but unless we try, we'll never find out how much success we can have. Another question? Do you think uh, acts of civil disobedience, like uh, such as uh, the libertarian activist Adam Kokesh, do you think those are, are worth the trouble anymore, or do you think it's better just to uh, try not to become disappeared? <laughs> uh, I have some respect and regard for acts of civil disobedience. I, I don't, I'm not going to endorse Kokesh. Uh, there are times when uh, people can show a lot of resolve and integrity by publicly just saying no 
and taking the consequences. <clears throat> At the same time, I don't encourage anyone to make himself a martyr. You're up against fiends. I think you're a damn fool, actually, if you sacrifice yourself, your family, or your friends, uh, merely to make a display of having confronted the state and its evil. Uh, so I would not recommend that. I would recommend that you take productive actions that help to move you into a more protected sphere. Many of you are young, and you're mobile as a result, more mobile than you will be later when you have families and more established jobs and connections and so forth. Uh, I would, if I were in your position, I would consider seriously getting out of this country. Not because I think any other country is a paradise, by the way, but because I think no other country has the means that the government of this country has to carry out these horrifying surveillance programs and other measures of state tyranny. So uh, I'm going to move. I'd suggest you might consider moving somewhere else. And don't be put off by the fact that other places are not, not uh, islands of laissez-faire. Uh, many, many other countries in the world are, are, are perfectly awful from the standpoint of the kinds of governments they have. But thank goodness those governments are poorer. There's a microphone. Oh. Do you encourage people to actively per participate in politics? Because if you cannot defeat them, you might just join them. And after you take over power, you might be able to do something Gorbachev did to Soviet Union and just dissolve everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't recommend that. Uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, the question is whether I recommend uh, one involve himself in politics to sort of act from within and subvert the system that way. And I don't recommend that because I think the, the odds of success are next to nil. And because I think in the process, it's the more likely outcome is that you will be co-opted and sucked into becoming a cog in the great wheel. Uh, everybody's subject to incentives and constraints. So, you know, there's a long tradition, say, among, um, among Christians to come out from among them <laughs> and be separate. Uh, I urge people to come out from among the state and be separate to the extent that you can. Obviously, we live in a world pervaded by state actions, so it's virtually impossible for anyone to completely divorce himself from the state and some of its effects, but uh, there's a matter of greater and less. And so what I actually recommend is that people, to the extent that they can, remove themselves from politics, not that they participate in it at all. I, I personally loathe politics and have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Uh, I run away screaming. Uh, I, I don't even want to tell you how horrifying I find every aspect of politics because this is a family-oriented show. <laughs> Uh, I'm doing what you're suggesting, making plans to leave. Um, so I'd like, and I'll, I think you mentioned being af afraid. I think there's great power and great fear. So you get to decide whether you want to be afraid at the end of the day, I think. And so I think there's a lot of potential in that, I, I would say. But I would like to ask you, um, maybe you can offer some concrete advice from what your own plans are, what you're doing now, uh, to somebody like me or to people like us who may be doing the same or similar things to what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly don't pretend to have any expertise as an advisor in that regard, and, and I, I generally don't like to give advice to young people at all. Uh, <laughs> if you'd like to read... If you'd like to read my biography, you'll understand why. <laughs> but in any event, uh, I think there are things anyone can do that are sensible and probably helpful, even if you never leave uh, this country. And uh, as I was telling some of you yesterday in the, uh, the Q&A we had, I think it's a very good idea that when you're training and deciding on how, how you want to specialize, the skills you want to learn when you're young, 
that you acquire some skills that are mobile. Uh, learn how to do something that you can do in many parts of the world uh, about equally well. Now, of course, there are many kinds of employments and jobs and skills that are, that are place specific, either specific to a given firm or specific to a given country or whatever. So there's a limit to, to how much can be done. But nowadays, particularly, many of you are very knowledgeable about information technology. You're, you've grown up, you younger people. It's been a part of your lives uh, all the time. And so you're, you're at ease with it, and many of you are very expert with it. That's great. You can do that from virtually any place on Earth. All you need is an Internet connection. And, uh, and so that, that's a good way to go. But there are many other ways. There are so many ways to be entrepreneurial that can be carried out in other parts of the world. Uh, if you have any wealth to, to dispose of or have anything you, you're investing right now, I would recommend uh, international diversification. Uh, certainly don't put all your wealth in, in any kind of investment in the United States because it may later become impossible for you to move it across a national boundary and you'll be impoverished if you decide to leave and can't take your wealth with you. So there, there are ways to just think differently about your situation. Don't think about your situation as if you were going to be stuck necessarily within the boundaries of the United States because I think life is going to become very bad within those boundaries and even if you don't think today that there's a problem you consider serious, you may later find that you do consider it to be serious, serious enough that you want to flee and you'll be better off if that day comes, should it come, you are prepared uh, to carry out some kind of escape more successfully. So that would be a kind of general piece of advice, but I think uh, many other people would offer that as well. Okay, we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Bob, for your inspiring talk. <laughs>